each of you today. And I think my wife may have mentioned it, but just in case I missed it, to all of our guests, we want to say welcome to New Life. We love you. We're so thankful that you're here. And if this is your first time at one of our services, the, the, the couple of things that I try to say every Sunday. Number one is that uh, we want you to feel welcome here. Number two, we want you to know that we consider you our guest, which means you're special to us. Anything we can do to serve you. Number three, and this is real important, we hope you don't get used to the guest treatment because as far as we're concerned right now, as of now, we are a family here at, at this church. We consider one another as family. And as far as we're concerned, first visit or not, we just want to say welcome to the family. We are so glad you're here. New Life, let them know we mean that. Amen. Now, here's the cool thing. I said the guest treatment ends. We're still going to serve you. We're still going to love you. If there's anything we can do for you, please don't you ever hesitate to ask or let us know, especially if it's anything from a spiritual perspective or if there's something we can do to minister to you and your family. That is who we are. That is what we do. And sometimes it's just a, an ear to hear. It's just a, a voice to encourage. Uh, sometimes it's just a, it's offering a ride to church. Sometimes it's even buying your meal if that's needed. But I'm going to tell you something. You found good people here at New Life. The other thing I'll mention to you, and I, I don't say this as often, but I'll mention it. I ask people to, to just give us six opportunities. I vary back and forth between three and six, depending on how the service is going. Every service is different. And uh, one thing I know is that if you show up over the next six Sundays, you're going to feel a full experience of who we are as a church, from the preaching to the singing to et cetera. There's a lot of people not here today, and uh, a lot of people sick. We had a round of sickness, not all COVID, but some of it COVID. And uh, we took a break on Wednesday night just to make sure that everybody that was sick knew they were sick so that they stayed home and uh, reminded people of you are experiencing symptoms. Don't come around me. Amen. Praise God. But uh, there's a lot of, we have, I wouldn't say half the church, but it feels kind of like that. We have a ton of families out today. In fact, if you know them, you might mention them in prayer this week. Thankfully, no serious illnesses or cases of, of uh, serious cases of COVID. But give us six is what I'm saying. Give us six Sundays so you get a full picture of who New Life is and what we are about and how uh, the power of the Holy Ghost is working in our midst. We're not just a church that is in name only. We are a church, meaning the place, the dwelling place of the Most High God. You're going to see people in this place that have been delivered from drugs. You're going to see people in this place that looking around right now, even with a lot of folks gone, there are people whose marriages were on the verge of, of, of divorce and breaking up, but God healed their family. There are people that have been sick in their body, and the doctor said it don't look good, but they're still here today because God touched them. I'm telling you, you give us a few Sundays, you're going to experience something that you will absolutely never want to go without. Amen. So welcome and uh, give us six in Jesus' name. Also re regarding six, in just a few weeks we're starting something called This Is Home on Sundays. We're going to go over uh, who we are as a church, what we what we believe and who we are and, and what we offer and kind of what makes up New Life Tabernacle, our history. We're going to get a little into that. And uh, ultimately it culminates, we're going to talk about places that every person can serve, no matter where you are in God. Maybe you're not ready to preach a message yet. You're, you're not there yet. You've got some, some learning to do and some progressing to do in the spirit. That's okay. We want to make sure you know, no matter who you are, right now you belong. You're important to the kingdom of God. You're important and valuable to this church. Our church has been going through a book together called I Am a Church Member. And it really goes through 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where if you read that chapter, you can't help but understand one thing for sure. Number one, the church is valuable. It's God's, it's God's body. It's what he designed. He designed it for a purpose. And number two, you take this away, that not everyone's going to be the same. Paul says, if we're all seeing, if we're all eyes, who's going to do the hearing? And if we're all ears, who's going to do the seeing? All of us play different roles that make up the church, but all of us are valuable and we have purpose in what God wants to do. Turn your neighbor and shout at him, that's you. 
Amen. So join us for This Is Home. We want to drive that home for several weeks in a row uh, with a series. And then that series actually will become what we call our discipleship program. Six weeks of making sure anyone brand new that wants to become connected to New Life knows this is who we are and this is what we want you to be a part of in Jesus' name. Genesis chapter 5. I changed when I walked in here today the message. I I want to postpone continuing where we left last week on even deeper. We're going to wait one week. Give everybody a chance, all of our home folks, to be back because uh, it is important for all of us that as many as can be here for the remainder of that message. So I felt like the Holy Ghost just say, why don't we put that on pause? And uh, it's a good thing as a preacher to have a whole lot of different thoughts that you can kind of listen to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 5 and uh, verse 20 is where we're going to begin. The Bible says, And all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And there's a very familiar name that you're going to see here. It says, And Enoch lived 65 years, and he begat Methuselah. Somebody say Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And then the, the scripture reveals the first, uh, the, the, the first translation, if you will, of a person from earth to glory. And there was, uh, there was a catching away, a rapture. Enoch, the Bible says, walked with God, and then he was not. Like he was there, and then he was not there, for God took him. I don't know, it's not the point of the message. I'm preaching about Methuselah, not Enoch. But can I just tell somebody, God is so pleased with an individual that purposes to walk with God. We can't really do a whole lot more or better thing than purpose our lives to walk with God. And in the meantime of holding on to God, reaching and grabbing as many people and introducing them to him as well. That's our purpose. Enoch walked with God, and God said, I like that so much, I'm just going to pluck you out of there. And then it says, and Methuselah, Methuselah lived 180 and seven years, and he begat Lamech, and Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years, and he died. 969 years and we know from that that he is the oldest person recorded to have lived such a long life he lived longer as far as we know than anyone this is before the flood this is when the atmosphere of the earth was different and uh, this is closer to a perfect world and a perfect environment and uh, and so things were a little different and it appears from the record of Genesis that Methuselah outlived them all. So I want to preach to you from a thought, all the days of Methuselah. Somebody say, all the days of Methuselah. Now, I've only heard Methuselah preached about once or twice in my whole life, having been raised in this. I've only preached about him once. I hope to share something today about a person in Scripture you've often heard about but know little about. Help you. Help us in Jesus' name. Would you lift your hands to heaven and pray that? God, talk to me from Methuselah's life today. Reveal something fresh. God, something I wasn't aware of. Lord, a different angle on a familiar subject. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help me to preach and help every single person in this house as hearers and doers of the word. Help us to respond to the message today with a purpose in our heart and God with a longing to be close to you in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you high five somebody, fist bump, holler at them, whatever is comfortable for you right now. Let them know you love them. Encourage them in Jesus' name. All the days, all the days of Methuselah. If you're like me, we are often inspired by the feats and the accomplishments of youth. But I believe that we can be equally inspired by the accomplishments of the elderly. Take, for example, Dr. Lila Denmark, 
who recently earned the title of the oldest practicing pediatrician, when she retired from her practice at 103 years of age. Or how about Carmela Busoda, who gave birth to healthy twins. I don't even know how this is possible, but at the age of 67, you talk about some delayed menopause. Hallelujah. Gladys Burrell, who completed a 26-mile marathon at the age of 92 years old. American folk artist Anna Moses, who was affectionately referred to as Grandma Moses, started her, started her painting career at 78 years of age and had one painting that sold for $1.2 million. There's Yuchiro Muri, who climbed Mount Everest at the age of 80. Now, personally, I just hope to be able to climb to the top of the stairs when I'm 80. Come on, somebody. <laughs> the... These are all men and women that etched their place in history because of their great accomplishments in their elderly years. Methuselah is known for one thing, as far as most of us are concerned, one thing in the scripture. He outlived everybody else. He was able to live for 600 years of his grandson's lives. He lived for over 100 years with his great-grandson. He even outlived his own son by five years. And so for the better part of 10 centuries, for 97 decades, just 31 years shy of a millennium, Methuselah walked upon the earth. I want you to consider the physical specimen that Methuselah must have been in order to live 969 years, producing children at 187 years old, playing catch, I can just imagine, playing catch with his grandkids at, I don't know, 550 years of age. What an amazing man Methuselah must have been to outlive governments and nations and political systems. We know from ancient re uh, recording that the Achmenid Persian Empire, which is considered to be the first true empire and possibly the most powerful empire in the history of humanity, this empire had a population that comprised 44% of the then known population of the world. It connected world regions, including the Middle East, uh, North Africa, uh, Central Asia and India, Europe, the Mediterranean world, under the rule of Achaemenid Persian Empire. There was peace in the Middle East for 200 years. And yet even this powerful global empire endured a lifespan of only 220 years. The Roman Empire, which rose under the military prowess of a conquering army and stabilized on the strength of government, uh, culture, and architecture, uh, philosophy, and science. Even then, though, the Roman Empire, which still has great influence upon the modern world that we live in today, lasted for just five over 500 years, just a little over 500 years. Uh, the great nation that we are blessed to live in, uh, we're celebrating a couple hundred, into the couple hundred years now. What are we in the 240s, I think, something like that. And I, I don't know about you. I love this nation. I, I know that it's imperfect, but there's so, so much potential and so much greatness from which we've come. And if you add all of the lifespans, though, of all of these pro prolific and some arguably say the greatest and most powerful nations and empires ever to exist, you're still going to fall short of the lifetime of one man named Methuselah. All the days of Methuselah were 969 years. It makes me ponder what can be attributed, attributed to the staggering lifespan of Methuselah. And I'm sure there have been many sermons that have been preached. I mentioned I've only heard a couple in my whole life. But I'm sure somebody's talked about what their perception of the secret of the strongest or, uh, or, the, or the most uh, the, the one with the most longevity in life, I'm sure there have been others that have preached it. But what I do know is that there have been a whole lot of other subjects and messages. For instance, I know a lot of people that have preached on the secret of the strongest man in the Bible, Samson. It was his strength that they preach about and the secret that, that was the Nazarite, that his commitment to God. And, and there are many lessons that have been taught from the vaults of wisdom of the wisest man in the Bible, Solomon. So he got the strongest man and the wisest man. But I, I just happened this morning to believe there is relevance to finding what could possibly have been the reason of the long life of Methuselah. We've talked about the strongest and the wisest. 
How about the oldest? Now, the reason why I want to know this is spiritual, but I'll also tell you if we could somehow narrow it down to a diet, I want to know what Methuselah was eating. I don't think it's that, though. Theologically, I believe there is evidence all over the place to perhaps legitimize all the days of Methuselah. In Psalm 91, verses 14 and 16, the Bible says, The word of the Lord says, Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high. Why? Because he hath known my name. Or the way the New Living Translation phrases verse 14, it says, The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. Verse 15 says, he shall call upon me and I'll answer him. And it says, I will be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. And then it says, with long life will I satisfy him and show him myself. I don't know about you. I could stop and preach right there. The Bible talks about a God that loves us when we serve him and love him. Maybe that's the secret. I don't know, but but there's certainly some evidence there. Undoubtedly, the 91st Psalm of David could provide sound explanation for the extended life of Methuselah. He was a man that loved the Lord and put his trust in his name. Or perhaps we could look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, which tells us that in honoring and obeying our parents, come on, somebody, all the kids ought to listen right here. We fulfill the first commandment with a promise when we obey this. And as verse 3 says, we are to obey our parents that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long upon the earth. Perhaps, Perhaps the longevity of the days of Methuselah was the product of respect and obedience and honor to which he showed his parents. I mean, that would certainly provide a satisfying biblical explanation. He was just extra good at listening. Praise God. Hallelujah. He could even be, we could reason that he, he, it could be the result that biblically the evidence of the endurance of Methuselah wasn't about him at all, but rather perhaps it was the reward of a faithful father. In Deuteronomy 11 and 8, Moses speaks to the children of Israel. This is the life of a married man. My wife's hair, somehow, in my clothes, praise God. It was just bugging me, Lucas. I could feel it every time I moved my arm. (laughs) Deuteronomy 11 and 8, Moses speaks to the children of Israel and says, and I quote, therefore shall you keep all the commandments which I command you this day. And he says again in verse 13, And it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently unto my commands that I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. He goes on and tells them, lay these words in your heart and in your soul. Bind them on your hands. Make them to be as frontlets between your eyes. And then he says, Teach them to your children. Write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. And in verse 21 it says, That your days may be multiplied and that of the days of your children in the land the Lord shall share unto your fathers. I don't know, maybe there's a lesson we could stop and learn from Methuselah's life right there, that he was a godly father, a righteous father, or Enoch was a righteous father, and Methuselah's life bore the the example of that, and I could just preach there for a minute, I won't, but let me say to the parents, what we do in this place and how we live outside of this place absolutely affects the lives of our children. It impacts them for generations to come, and as long as the Lord lives, he's looking for some godly people parents that will be diligent in leading their families. Why? Because it's a good thing and it affects the longevity of our lives. All kind of reasons perhaps theologically or biblically that we could exegete from the scripture. We we know the father of Methuselah was a righteous man. Genesis 5.24 tells us Enoch walked with God. Hebrews 11.5 tells us that the faith of Enoch had apprehended the testimony that he pleased God. Come on, parents, we need to be having that testimony. Our kids ought to be able to say about us at least one thing. They lived a life pleasing to God. It mattered to them to live right. 
I can see most of my amen corner must have gotten sick. I said it pleases God when parents are intentional about setting a standard in the home that says if it doesn't line up with this book, if it's not according to the book, if it violates this book. He walked with God. He pleased God. And so righteous and faithful was Enoch that he would not see death, Hebrews says, for God took him. It would be biblically sound for us to deduct all the days of Methuselah perhaps were the reward of a righteous father's faithful walk with God. Perhaps. We can with sound theology and biblical certainty come to the conclusion that all of the days of Methuselah was more than just good genes or an organic diet. Perhaps we could at least reason that it's definitely some of these reasons, the result of this man living a long life was that he loved the Lord, put his trust in his name. He was a man that honored and obeyed his parents and therefore received the promise of Scripture, the reward of a long life. Or in addition to that, we could perhaps just sum, summarize that these three points are what it was. God, it was a godly reward, not only because of his obedience to his father, but because his father was faithful and righteous and had a testimony that he pleased God. But perhaps... There is just a little bit more to the long life of Methuselah. While Genesis and Hebrews identify Enoch as a righteous man that pleased God and walked with him, the epistle of Jude, verse 14 and 15, reveals that Enoch, everybody shout Enoch. Enoch was also a prophet. He prophesied, watch this, the prophetic word of Enoch can be summarized simply as this. Enoch was known for prophesying that judgment is coming because the world was in chaos. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Verse 15 in Jude says, To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Undoubtedly, Noah's great-grandfather Enoch had seen the vision of the coming flood of judgment that would convince all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds that they had committed. Perhaps he had received vision of the waters covering the earth, the entirety of it, and the destruction of of the ungodly under those churning waters. Or you could say, well, perhaps he had no knowledge of how exactly the judgment would come upon the ungodly. He simply had a word from the Lord that judgment would come. Not only did he have a revelation and a word that judgment would come, but we can also find that Enoch knew when the judgment would come. We find this revelation wrapped up in our subject today. We find it wrapped up in the name of his son that he would adequately name Methuselah. You see, a full translation of the name Methuselah means his death shall bring. Or when he dies, judgment shall come. One etymologist went as far as to declare that the name Methuselah literally translates, when he dies, then the flood. In fact, the scripture records it was the very year that Methuselah died, judgment came, and the fountains of the deep broke open, and the windows of heaven were opened up, and the whole earth was flooded. The Lord had spoken to Enoch, judgment is coming, but as long as that boy is alive, I'll hold back my judgment. As long as there's a Methuselah walk in the earth, judgment will be withheld. And righteous Enoch knew the day that boy stops breathing is the day that judgment comes. All the days of Methuselah, Methuselah, what I'd like to share with you today is simply this. All the days of Methuselah were days where God's mercy said, I'm going to hold back another day. I love my people. 
I love my creation just enough. As long as he's alive, I'm going to let somebody search for grace. As long as he's living, I'm going to let somebody make a change. As long as he's breathing. All the days. Every day that Methuselah lived, every day of his 969 years was the mercy of the Lord refusing his judgment. The long life of Methuselah was more than a man that just ate the right diet, more than a man that just kept the right commandments, more than just a man obeying mom and dad, more than just the reward of a faithful father. The long life of Methuselah was the testimony of the mercy of the Lord. And I've come to this pulpit to remind someone today, you're not going to outlive the mercy of God. Ephesians tells us that the Lord is rich in mercy. Jeremiah says he's rich in mercy. James tells us mercy rejoices over judgment. I'm preaching about a God of mercy today. Lamentation 3 and 22 declares that it is because of the mercy of the Lord that we are not consumed. And I've come to tell somebody in this house today that Methuselah is still alive in essence. The mercy of the Lord is still present and the judgment of the Lord is being with hell. And I don't know about you, I don't know why we'd waste another day if we're in need of his mercy. Come on somebody, run to mercy. If you're in need of his grace, somebody run to the Father's house. I promise you, he's got his eye on the horizon watching your return. Rich in mercy. Another reason that Methuselah had to live. His name meant that when he dies, the judgment comes. Number two, another reason Methuselah had to live. There couldn't be a Noah without Methuselah. Come on, somebody put the theology together. For those of you that need help, let me help you. When Methuselah was 300 years of age, his son Lamech gave birth to a baby boy. Well, his wife did, pretty sure. That he, the father Lamech, would name Noah. In 2 Peter 2 and 5, the Bible tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. For 600 years, the strength of Methuselah remained because the mercy of the Lord said, I've got a preacher of righteousness down there contending for the souls of lost people. There's a preacher down there making a way of escape. He's building an ark. And if, if, if they'll listen, come on, Methuselah, you can't die yet because mercy has got to give the preacher time to contend for the souls of the ungodly. And listen, I'm not talking about the office of a pastor. I'm talking to everybody in this room. We are all preachers of righteousness. We are all declarers of the gospel. We are all able to testify of God's goodness. For 900, or rather 696 years after the birth of his grandson, Methuselah would live on. This was God giving time for the preacher to preach. In Matthew 24 and 14, the Bible says, it tells us this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Can I preach to somebody and tell you, I know the world is dark with sin. I know it feels like it can't hardly get any worse, but let me remind you that where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Come on, preacher, exercise your voice. Come on, lady and man of God. Start reaching for somebody. Start testifying. Why? Because it's holding back judgment. The only thing holding back the flood was the lifespan of Methuselah. And the only thing holding back the judgment of the world today is the advancement, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. You may think you're better off without the church. If you could just... Get away from the voice of the preacher. But the only thing holding back judgment is in fact there's a preacher and there's a church. 
just the mercy of God saying, you keep preaching, saints of God. Keep declaring the gospel, church. Come on, keep being the watchman on the wall, men and women of God. I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Come on, just keep reaching. Come on, church, just keep praying. What are you doing? It's the days of Methuselah. God's holding back judgment. Hang on a minute. There's someone hungry right there, and there's a commissioned soul that's going to share the gospel with them. Hold back. The wrath of God waits the days of Methuselah. John 9 and 4 says, The night cometh when no man can work. Day is far spent. We are in this time, what we call a dispensation of grace. But hear me, judgment will come for the sin and the ungodly. But as long as it's waiting, that tells me mercy is saying, Preacher, lift your voice. Wrath is on hold all the days of Methuselah. Nearly finished this morning. But before we go, I want to share one more thing. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 tells us that somewhere in the midst of all the days of Methuselah, the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Somewhere in the midst of those days that made up the 969 years, Someone started searching for grace. We know the tragedy of the story is that despite God's delay, despite him waiting, only Noah, and by extension of Noah's faithfulness, his sons and their family, eight souls were saved. Oh, I hope somebody catches what I'm about to say. Just one person found that grace and then affected a few others. We are so often thinking God is only interested in the crowds. Ha. I don't care if you feel like you're alone. I don't care what you're going through. In the darkest moments when you feel all by yourself, you hear me, mercy and grace is available. If you're searching, even if it's just one, God says, hold up, judgment. Hold off, wrath. I'm not ready. There's one searching. There's one looking for me. There's, I got I to gotta go to him. Come on, somebody. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All the hundreds of thousands and millions of people and God laser focused. There's one. And I'm going to hold back until he gets the ark finished and until he gets his family on board. Don't you, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right here. Don't you stop praying for your family. Don't you stop interceding for your family. Don't you stop being the one that'll stand in the gap and hold back the judgment of God. Don't you stop being the one that says, I'm looking for grace. Because if you look for it, God will say, hold up a minute. There's one. Don't you ever underestimate the power of one person searching for God and the influence that I have on your family. Somewhere in the midst of those days, someone's looking for grace. And so Methuselah, you got to keep living or else the judgment is coming. I have to wonder sometimes, the older Methuselah got, if he, like a lot of elder saints that I've pastored or been around, even grandparents that said, I'm just ready, I'm ready to go. I wonder there were times Methuselah was like, God, why have you not taken me yet? I'm ready, these bones are hurting, it's hard climbing the stairs, no more Mount Everest for me, and God saying, Methuselah, just hold out. I'm holding back wrath because the prophecy's been given. When you go, wrath comes. But there's somebody looking for grace. There's an ark of safety that's got to be finished. Methuselah, I'm going to have to keep extending your life because there's somebody down there that needs to find grace. And you can't find grace in the middle of judgment. You will only find grace in the multitude of mercy. 
Come on, somebody. Anybody see with eyes of faith right now? We're holding back judgment by our prayers. Come on, pray and go. It's important. Why? We're holding back judgment. Come on, somebody. I talked about pray and go last week. 45 minutes, one time a month is all I'm asking. What are we doing? We're searching for mercy. We're finding grace. We're pathfinders, giving a way of escape. Pastor, what's pray and go? You come talk to me and I'll tell you all about it. But what I'm trying to say is I see people coming in my, in my mind's eye. I can see they're coming to our church and they're looking for grace. Come on, somebody. His grace is still sufficient. Judgment has not come. Grace is still available. That thorn in your flesh, Paul, that messenger of Satan that's trying to wear you out, don't worry. My grace is sufficient. But you need to be looking for it. You come searching for grace, and grace ain't hard to find. Stand with me. The Bible says, "For by grace are you saved through faith. Now you have to obey the gospel. You need to repent of your sins. The first time the question was asked after the ascension of Jesus, the Holy Ghost has been poured out in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. Causes such a stirring and commotion. People are asking what's going on and Peter begins to preach about the Jesus that they had crucified was both Lord and God. And so moved by the power of the message, the question is asked, men and brethren, what must we do? You know what that question signified to God and to the apostles? Someone's in search of grace. And Peter says, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to apply that grace by repenting. Repent and be baptized. What does that do? It removes the record. Why? For the remission of sins, the washing away in the name of Jesus. Repent, be baptized. And you know what? God's promised you his gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. There's evidence of it begin to speak with an unknown tongue. And then after that initial sign, you have a prayer language that you can intercede on behalf of others yourself, the kingdom of God. And then there's the continuing evidence, you might say, of the Holy Ghost, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. What is it? It's just the result of someone searching for grace and God saying let's hold back I still got some time I don't know what every individual here I know some but I don't know every issue that you might be encountering but I wonder if there's anyone today in search of grace a fresh touch a fresh encounter Grace isn't just for the mercy to forgive sin. Grace is that thing that allows the favor of God to move in our lives beyond the issue of salvation. To pour out blessing, to work things out, to give answers, to heal bodies. That's grace working. James says, he giveth more grace. Not just good enough to save you. It's more than that. It's the sufficient grace of God that helps hold us up in the times of challenge. It's the sufficient grace of God that says, I'm going to open doors that you can't open. I wonder if there's anybody in need of some grace today that you'd like to come to the altar. You'd like to bring your family. Husband, grab the wife by the hand. Wife, grab the husband by the hand. Children, mom and dad, grab. Come on, somebody come today. Find a place in this altar and say, God, I'm searching for grace. Because the message of all the days of Methuselah is that God cares about issuing grace. God cares about those that are in search of him. He'll hold back the judgment. Why? Somebody's after me. 
Somebody's searching. Oh, what a beautiful response. Can you begin to lift your hands, begin to call out to God, whatever that issue is. Maybe you're going through a time of hardship. Maybe you're, maybe you're having an issue between you as a couple, husband and wife. Maybe it's something going on with your kids. Maybe it's a healing. Maybe it's a sickness in your body. You need God to intervene. Maybe it's something beyond your control in your finances, your job situation. God, I need your grace. I need your grace. Lord, I'm battling in my mind. Lord, I'm battling with depression and anxiety, God. Lord, there's confusion. There's brokenness. There's anguish. There's sorrow. I need your grace, God. Come on, that's where it starts. The acknowledgement and the search for grace. Can't make it long. No. Gotta have your mercy. 